And joining me right now is Mr. Ed Dames. How are you, my friend? I'm good, thank you, Michael. Very nice. I'm glad you're here, Ed. I've been wanting to do this for quite some time now, and we finally have had the opportunity to do that. And for many, many years now, I've heard your voice late night on the radio. Yeah, I was there. I started with uh, Coast to Coast AM in September or October, I think, of uh, 1996. And I'm still doing Coast to Coast occasionally. So next year will be my uh, thirty, uh, my third jubilee, 30 oh years in Coast to Coast. That is pretty wild. It is, yeah. How the time just flies on by, though, to be honest with you. Yeah, and I'm good. Uh, I'm retiring from my my uh, job. It's pretty. It has pretty much burned me out. My second career after the army, and uh, I'll be conducting one more seminar for the public in uh, November 16th and 17th in Phoenix, and then with the that's it. With the exception of April, I've agreed to do become be a speaker at the um, uh, Ozark Mountain UFO Conference, but uh, that's it. Otherwise, I'm on the road and on, on, you know, uh, uh, in the field on real world uh, projects. Uh, one of them is uh, retrieving, well, not retrieving, but uh, helping Madeline McCann, this girl that disappeared at four years old a long time ago, get home to her parents. She's alive, she turned 21, disappeared when she was almost four, reached almost four years old and she's 21 now and wow. doesn't realize that the parents she's living with are not her biological parents. So I've got that and some Bigfoot work, a six month stakeout project on Bigfoot and really looking forward to getting out from underneath uh, a roof. My God. And, and she doesn't know that. No, um, she was abducted. Uh, it's a famous case is still active. You know, it's still famous. Uh, she was abducted. When she, she just before she reached the age of four, and everybody thinks she's except for me and one FBI agent, we have both agree and have reached the same conclusion independently that she was made to order uh, or she was ordered. Oh my! That somebody uh, these wealthy these wealthy groups of people uh, put out the word on the on the back burner. This I want a, a little girl, Ron. Blah blah blah. And then people abduct her and sell her on the mar- on the market. So uh, luckily, she was she was purchased by a very wealthy wealthy couple who know that they purchased uh, an abducted girl, but didn't tell her. And she um, so she grew up uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada, after being trafficked through Vancouver, Canada, and down into the states. And uh, so I have to work with law. I've been working with law enforcement. Right. That's a totally different story. But it looks like uh, I'm going to have to do this myself. My goodness. Well, best of luck to you and best, best of luck well, to her. You know, the, I, the, uh, in, in, in April, I yeah. mean, uh, I did a similar, similar thing in April. I, I was in France three times, three back-to-back trips, 14 hours each way in uh, April to find the the remains of a small, a a toddler who disappeared in the French gendarmes. Couldn't find him. I waited six months. I said, I got to step in and find this child. Uh, So I ended up finding his remains and went to France to to discuss on television with this guy who's essentially the Oprah Winfrey of French TV. I was on a show three times in April to try to, to explain to the French people who were extremely interested in how the heck I used these skills, uh, technical remote viewing, to find this child when the police couldn't. So it was like being back on, on the radio in 1996 again, explaining to people what remote viewing mm, yeah. is and that DOD really had a psychic spying team, those kinds of things. So it was like old times all over again then. It was, but uh, pretty exhausting. Uh, oh, the the French people kept calling me a medium, and I kept telling you can see right. this. The, the, the television shows are recorded, so you can watch me say I am not a medium multiple times. You know, I'm a trained remote viewer. This is what we do, but uh, it's, it, it takes a while. <laughs> Absolutely, and I saw that Daily Mail article, and they were calling you an ex-CIA psychic. 
Yeah, no, they called it. I, I didn't call myself that, obviously. But, right. Uh, and I understand. I completely understand the public's introduction to something like this. They have nothing else to, you know, uh, to call me other than a psychic. But if you want to want to see all the details of the story and how I found this child when the police and the dogs missed him, they walked right over the child's remains. Uh, you you can just you can Google uh, CIA psychic spy France and then all the details will pop up. Right, Emile Soleil, I believe his name is. Yeah, Emile uh, Emile Soleil. Uh, he, he was two years old. He took off a small village, about thirty people in southern France, out the door. And I don't know if you've ever had children, but I had. A lot of grandkids and children, when they book, they they run fast at two years old. So he's in his diaper. He takes off and never comes back. And so I had to put all the, uh, not only find, I waited six months expecting the police to to find him, dead or alive. But after they couldn't find him, I said, okay, I got to step in now. What I do. Stepped in, found the remains, and then I established how the child uh, died. He was a vehicular homicide victim accident. But the driver, instead of uh, dealing with this the right way, the ethical way, decided to hide the child's body. Oh, no. So and then I had to track back, you know, the, the driver and find his house. Yeah, it's a very sad story for those who are curious about it. You could look it up for yourselves, but... As, it is, but it's closure, mm, Michael. Actually, yes, it is, absolutely. And, uh, Ed, just to uh, get things uh, started here, I, I wanted to start from uh, your military background as we jump back and forth here. Yeah, oh, oh okay, so uh, originally I was Airborne Infantry in 1967. I enlisted during the Vietnam War, transferred over to Army Security Agency, still as a sergeant and got out. Went to UC Berserkley, studied biophysics and Chinese Mandarin, but civilian life was too boring for me. So I got commissioned, went back in in 1978, and ended up uh, uh, as the first uh, uh, tactical electronic warfare officer for the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment in Germany during the Cold War. And then I was transferred uh, to a very, very, one of the first very, very classified uh, jobs. And uh, and then I ended up at the Office of Secretary of Defense in, at the celestial levels of intelligence and where I had, I was a, a biological warfare spy master at that time as well. I briefed the President of the United States. If you go to my website, you can see my, my citations and medals. Uh, for those kinds of things, but uh, there were certain targets in the former Soviet Union that I could not penetrate by hook or by crook because it was my job to, to you know, to, to bust open both the nuclear, exotic, and exotic weapons and biological warfare weapons programs, which were highly classified. And I had everything at my disposal, satellites, agents on the ground, everything I needed, stuff that I still can't talk about in order to collect the intelligence that I needed. To, to fabricate defenses for our soldiers against these things. My job was to prevent technological surprise on future battlefields. But I couldn't penetrate these programs, except I had one hip pocket organization, this nascent psychic spying unit that the Army was experimenting with. And it turns out they were giving me a foot in the door for a lot of these projects, where foot in the door meaning right. they said, hey, This laboratory that you're looking for here that's producing anthrax is actually over here. So because of those kinds of things, I was able to to redirect the look angles on U.S. satellites and gather much more information that that I could use to to put together a program, a penetration program to find out what was actually going on in those types of sites. Uh, exotic weapon sites to uh, uh, directed energy weapons, whether to find out particle beam weapons, uh, are they are they polarized or, or neutral particle beam weapons? Is this particular biological warfare agent uh, uh, African equine encephalitis or simply anthrax? Those kinds of things. And this unit was getting. Uh, I was their best customer, so I eventually was so enthralled with this unit, I stepped down 
I mean, celestial levels of, of intelligence and OSD that take over as operations and training officer. And that's how it started. Absolutely. And when you were first approached about this, what did you initially think, by the way? Did you think, well, these guys have lost their minds? No, I wasn't approached. I owned them. I would, they were one of, they were one of the, the many assets that I had at my disposal to collect intelligence. And, uh, they were giving me data and information that no other asset c- could give me, including my agents. And, uh, so I saw what they were doing, what their capabilities were. But they were, they were actually psychics like Joe McMonagall, a famous, uh, remote viewer. Correct. And then when, uh, remote viewing, coordinate remote viewing was discovered in the laboratory at Stanford Research Institute, then, uh, the psychic ability, being clairvoyant, right. and, uh, uh, became systematized. A system was developed, a syntax and grammar, if you will, for how unconscious part of our mind communicates to conscious awareness. And uh, I, I, I took that program over. Right, but maybe I should rephrase that differently and say... When you first heard of remote viewing, did you think that was a little out of the realm? When I, um, I didn't care. I didn't care. You My just job went for it. Was to, to, get, to get the mission. I'd screw the whales, screw the civilians, get the job done. Uh, that kind of thing. I, I see. I'm a little bit different now, but in those days, you know, it was you just get. The, I don't care what it takes to succeed. If these guys are giving me the right information, then, then fine. Uh, and in my civilian life, work, working with all these very famous contractors, Bechtel, Ford Motor Corporation, Lawrence Rockefeller's laboratories, they didn't they didn't understand remote viewing, and, but they just said, James, we don't care how you're doing it. But you're giving us information and nothing else can. Well, that was my original you know, position in in the military. I, I didn't see. care how these guys were doing it. Understood. And according to my information, you were trained by Ingo Swan. Ingo Swan, yeah, considered the father of remote viewing, and uh, he trained uh, 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 six of us, uh, army officers and civilians. And the new technique of coordinate remote viewing. And it was my job to take that discovery into the deep dark world of intelligence and massage it into a useful information collection tool that could be used in support of the national intelligence community. So that I had to evolve the tool because there were a lot of things that we couldn't use it for, that we needed to use it for. And the Stargate project, or Project Stargate, whichever you want to call it, first began way back in 72 and ended around roughly 95, I believe. And the CIA concluded that it wasn't useful to any capacity. And I've always been curious on how truthful that was. No, it wasn't truthful. But to the CIA, it became a white elephant and a real hot potato. And the the DCI, the Director of Central Intelligence at that time, said, get rid of it. So, so none, uh, much as the public knows now, and your audience, I'm sure, yeah. who are interested, tons of stuff have been released about uh, Stargate uh, uh, training operations, but very little of the of the actual combat operations, tactical and strategic operations that we did. In fact, lots of that information was shredded. But since I was the operations and training officer, I still have, have uh, access to all the information. Yes, I've always been curious on how truthful that was since the government and many government agencies aren't exactly known for their transparency, let's be honest. And one example, he's right. That's an understatement, Michael. (laughs) Right. And an example we could use is the research that was done in regards to UFOs or UAPs. You know, they claim to have no interest, yet they spend millions and millions of dollars on this. Well, in the beginning, uh, let's say the beginning of 35, 40 years ago, the last, you, you're not going to get a government that said, like ours that says, we don't know. Because people, that, uh, that, that undermines the trust that people have in the government. But what do you mean you don't know? You're the government. Science, all the scientific community and all that. So that, <clears throat> that was the syndrome way back when. But after a while, when civilians started getting involved, civilian scientists, then the government realized it's kind of stupid. 
you know, to continue our, our saying we don't know when the civilian scientists are saying, you know, hey, take a look at this, uh, nuclear weapons systems shut down, those kind of things like that. So now, uh, I mean, this our, this conversation can go on for weeks. Uh, uh, for the, the cut to the chase, let's say, okay, so uh, technical remote viewing, there's the, it's direct knowledge. There's no middleman. It's just direct knowledge. Right. Describe the target. Where is the target? And that's that's it. So a, a, a last week, a guy in San Antonio, Texas, filmed using some uh, 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 infrared photography uh, video. He filmed a, a, a boomerang-shaped UFO. Did you see that report? I don't think I did, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's pretty wide. It was pretty widely uh, widely distributed, and, and uh, <clears throat> so what I did the last two two days is is first check to see if that was not computer generated an image, and it was, and it was a real thing, and turned out not to be a kite or something else like that. It was a real exotic uh, thingamajig. So I tracked it back, and so I'll be putting out a report publicly about where that thing is right parked right now right and uh people will be very interested it's parked at the nellis air force range in a hangar in nellis air force range very secretive place right but i, I want to put a pinpoint on that <clears throat> so people so i can tell people hey this is ours not this is not something else uh, and that <clears throat> recently i've been talking about ultra terrestrials these are not extraterrestrials and scientists are coming along and, and uh, with, with I and Jacques Vallée, who who I've taken to the field before on CE2 contacts paid for wow. by the Crown Prince of Liechtenstein. Uh, we we both agree and, and came to the same conclusion independently that these are not extraterrestrials and what they are is ultra terrestrials and they they can parse back and forth from the material existence to someplace else. I'm not going to call it a dimension because I don't know, but they're right. based. I follow, I follow uh, the UAPs, mm -hmm. and I was on the very first UAP. We, we didn't call it UAPs then, but UFO working group way back in 1990. I was on the, it was the youngest member on the very first interagency working group. We all had every clearance in the world way beyond top secret stuff. So we met to discuss, hey, what are we dealing with here? And uh, so, uh, but and now the taxpayers are paying for all these working groups. And, and, and in the beginning, we disguised ourselves as the Advanced Theoretical Physics Working Group. And I still have the names of all the attendees. The people now, these these groups, the taxpayers are paying for. These are these guys are babes in the woods. They're still using physical and, and material types of approaches to try to discern what what we're dealing with in terms of UAPs. But they, they have no clue. But anyway, we track the UAPs. My team, uh, Matrix Intelligence Agency, tracks the UAPs, and, and many of them, many of them end up uh, stopping inside of the Pukau Seamount. The Pukau Seamount is about 2,500 feet underwater in around, oh, I'd say 100 kilometers to the west northwest of Easter Island. So these ultra terrestrials are inside the seamount, highly intelligent, far far beyond anything that we can comprehend and beyond comprehension. They're gonna have to if they want to educate us or get us to evolve some way, they're gonna have to step down. So we're we're trying to establish a a, a, a C three this time after all these years instead of just a C two. That's fascinating. I've never heard of a, of any of that before, especially with Jack Vallée. I had no idea you guys ever linked up together. Oh, I yeah, he, I took him to the field because when we discovered this hot zone in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, um, he wanted to go, so I grabbed him and we went out there. But the point is that yes. he, can, in, in terms of all the history, well, at least the last couple of hundred years or, and more, and the books that he's written, Passport to Magonia, is a good overall synopsis of the kind of nonsense and absurdity that we're dealing with vis-a-vis -vis the so-called UFO question. But he said, you know, these are not extraterrestrials. And my conclusion was we are being – they're purposely presenting themselves as a conundrum, a problem to be solved with all these nonsense types of things. 
Some of them are not nonsense, like shutting down nuclear weapons and that's sort of none. But the rest are Pascagoula, pancake incidents, and things like that. So they're presenting themselves as a conundrum to be solved. They're all all the Project Blue Book hypotheses, working hypotheses, all ten went out the door. They didn't work. They didn't answer the question, what are we dealing with? But technical remote viewing can, because it has no real, well, I won't say it has no limited, it, it does, but we, we can, we can gain access to what, for instance, is the system out there. For instance, a good representative of the, of the system is the orchestrators of the REL school event in 1994 in the town of Rua outside of Harare, Zimbabwe, where all the children who are now grown adults experience that experience. I call that the system of okay? you. So the system wants us to penetrate this conundrum and wants us to pull the curtain back on the wizard. I don't want to mix and match too many allegories here, but they want us to find them. And it can only be done by a consciousness tools, consciousness methods that are systematic and rigorous. You know, no, psychics aren't going to do this. It has to be military consciousness tools. And uh, so we did that. Now we found out that their protocols for a meeting is it, it's not if you build it, they will come. If you go there, they will meet. Mm. But you won't know where to go unless you have these tools. We have the tools, and now we know where to go. So that's one of the key reasons, which they asked me in my career, why I'm retiring from uh, uh, pu- uh, public appearances right. and, and, these, and shows like yours to go out in the field and actually do this. That's very fascinating, all of this, uh, truly. And, of course, the infamous Zimbabwe case also a favorite of mine, and I've always believed that the, those children, now adults, obviously, and what they saw. And uh, another thing I got to ask you is, do you think our government, the U.S. government, will actually disclose any of this? But, uh, I think they would like to, but, but there's two reasons they can't. Number one is they don't understand what they're dealing with. That's not that's the big one, right? And number two, Michael, is you, you have to, I don't know if the public is aware, I don't think they're aware of the fact that the kinds of instruments that we have aboard uh, certain KC-135s and the electronic warfare instruments that we have that measure signals in all bands, including uh, ultraviolet uh, light bands, um, all of this stuff is classified. And we would, if if we we would be giving away if we said, hey, okay, this these these here's what we see and where these people. These, the system is, for instance, is coming and going. Here's what we have. Well, that would give away the capabilities of some highly classified, highly classified instruments that we have. So that's a that's a problem. Uh, uh, it's a big problem in the business. You know, sources and methods, the old spycraft stuff. Understood. And going back to remote viewing for a second here, and uh, by the way, a book called The Men Who Stare at Goats is written back in 2004, which later became a movie featuring George (coughs) Clooney. Uh, I was curious what your thoughts were on all of that, by the way. Well, I was interviewed for the book, and then uh, uh, John Ronson, uh, uh, somehow they, 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 they made a screenplay out of that nonsense book. And uh, they also made so a, a I, television series, by the way, but it was only in the UK. I didn't know about that. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty wild, right? I didn't know that either until recently. And I guess that well, guy. I, I get to uh-huh. have I get to have some fun sometimes, and Hollywood loves me and, and oh, of all course. that. Uh, um, Tom Cruise wanted to play me in the movie Suspect Zero. Oh wow! But he was making The Last Samurai in New Zealand, so he asked Sir Ben Kingsley. Uh, the substitute. So I, I coached Sir Ben Kingsley for the movie, and I have a cameo as FBI remote viewing instructor. And the men of Sarah Goats, the movie, mm-hmm. um, uh, Kevin Spacey plays my role in the movie, and I'm interviewed on the back end for the real story. And did you like the movie, though? Um, uh, well, it's fun. It's fun. And, you know, anything is fun. It, it, when I'm 75, we get to be my age. Nothing's worth doing unless it's fun. So it was a fun movie. It wasn't representative, of course, of sure. the actual unit, but it was still fun. Yeah, some people didn't like it, but to be honest with you and to the listeners at home, I actually enjoyed the movie. I thought it was a pretty, it was a fun movie. 
Yeah, Suspect Zero, on the other hand, is way grim, very grim, uh, that, that one. And it's closer to the re- – that the model was me. They use me as a model because I go after child murderers. Right. And, uh, 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 and so that's that's pretty grim, and you don't want to know the details about those kinds of things. Oh, no, not at all. And one of the other things – You don't I, want to. Of course not, yes, absolutely. One of the other things that I was wondering uh, is um, – Sylvia Brown. Did you have any involvement Sylvia, with Sylvia? She's now. Yeah, she's she's gone now, but did you ever uh, help her out or do anything with her? No, no. She's just simply a psychic. And, uh, you know, people ask me, do I hire psychics? I said, nope, not unless they're, they're training remote viewers. And uh, it's, But Sylvia made a huge mistake, as you probably know, by yes. saying that those miners in the West Virginia mine were all alive and they would be rescued, and they were all dead. So Art Bell, you know, did, did, didn't have her on the show anymore after that. Those are mistakes that you don't make as a professional, not as a professional remote viewing. If my, if my employees make a mistake like Way less than that, they're fired. U eighty six. Fired. Okay. It would be like an airline pilot landing his aircraft twenty meters, you know, away from the landing strip, and say, "Look, it was only tw- look how close I was." Ah, uh-uh, you're out of here. My goodness. And uh, one other name that came to mind when we were talking earlier, you said Joe McMonaco, and I, I had read in an article where he said that you had exaggerated about your involvement in the in the government program. I'm not sure what no, what made him say those things, but it is in an article, and I was very curious what your thoughts yeah, were on that. Somebody said I was the commander, and oh. he said there was never a commander at Dems, and I didn't say I was the commander. I've always said I'm the operation training officer at the Defense Intelligence Agency. But somebody out there, he heard them say I was the commander. Some people call me a general and all that. So he heard that and reacted to it. He probably just – it was a miscommunication, I would have to imagine. You know, Joe, I use Joe in my opera. That, that's one of the reasons that I stepped down to take over the unit because Joe was giving me stuff that nothing else could give me. And, uh, but it, he, he had, he had heard that, uh, and, uh, and reacted to it. You know, there's, there's jealousies in the business like any other business. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, that's kind of what I felt was but stemming from I, that. I will never denigrate Joe because he served – Joe and I both got legions of merit. I don't know how – if you know that, that's a pretty big thing. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I, Joe and I both both received legions of merit. Yeah, I have a, I have a friend who uh, was friends with uh, Joe many, many moons ago, and, you know, I always thought uh, very highly of Joe. Well, I do too. Oh, yes. Yeah, I like Joe, but yeah, I, I was always very curious about that. And when you thought, but the, the thing about mm-hmm. Joe is that he's a natural psychic, and when he dies, which is not going to be long, uh, like me, but I think he'll beat me. I don't know. Uh, we can bet on that. But but <laughs> Joe is going to take all his knowledge with him. Yes. Whereas all my knowledge is up there at remoteviewingmatrix.com. Everything I know, from the fundamentals to the very very advanced scientific and medical stuff is up there as Clint downloadable virtual streaming clinics. So I people lose nothing when I book. Absolutely. And uh, another name that just came to mind was uh, Courtney Brown. Courtney was one of my first civilian students. When I retired, I set up a company and a training company. He was one of uh, my first students, but he wrote a book called Cosmic Voyeur. That was his Correct. Book based on remote viewing. I call it Cosmic Voyeur. And uh, he was driving round pegs into square holes and vice versa in terms of his analysis. I said, Courtney, I cannot. I, I was his trainer. If you read the book, he says there's a military trainer. But he doesn't mention my name because I made him take my name out of the book. Uh, uh, because it, 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 he was screwing up. Understood. Yes, and of course. But mm-hmm. Courtney, the reason I, I really uh, was attracted to Courtney originally is that as a social mathematician, as an applied mathematician in sociology, he's brilliant. And uh, he came to me because uh, he studied he studied the, the civilizations and, and societies and said, there's a couple of things in history that should not have happened that were uh, uh, aberrant. 
and uh, discontinuities in in terms of human cultural evolution. These things should not have happened. So he was looking at these these discontinuities and realized that remote viewing was a way to take a look and see what went down during those ages. So that's why he came to me to become a student. Understood. And to just jump into quick modern times, just for fun's sake, a lot of things are going on around the world, especially with Russia. Will we see any sort of a major conflict, in your opinion, Ed? Well, uh, if you go to my website, I have a bunch of, of uh, high-profile targets in my blog, uh, j just of a, 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 a interest, a mm -hmm. community uh, interest. Where's the Ark of the Covenant? Where's Noah's Ark? I'm working with the archaeologists uh, to, to find uh, the tomb of Cleopatra and those kinds of things. I have overhead of all those positions. And one of the projects I have is the top tactical nuclear targets that the Russians have in case they, they're going to go attack nuke. So that's there too, including the overhead and the street view of the actual target <clears throat> they have. And I lived, I lived in uh, Ukraine for many, many years. My house was blown up in 2014 because drunk Kiev artillerymen just randomly blew up people and villages in the West, the Russian speaking populace where I lived. I have photos of all my dead neighbors on the street after my house was blown up. I moved my Russian fiance to St. Petersburg, Russia to get her out of that. And after the Cold War was over, I met my Russian counterparts. The KGB had an extra sense team. Extra sense is the word they use for the stuff that we did. And these were very, very gifted psychics like we had originally. Uh, Hella Hammond, uh, Keith Harari, Ingo Swan, they had very gifted psychics too that they used against us. And we kind of joked about that when I met them. Uh, but I ended up going to St. Petersburg and helping them out to find a terrorist that was going to blow up the airport in St. Petersburg. So we neutralized him. And so I helped the Russians out with a, a Czech and terrorist. And, um, yeah, so I've had an interesting history with the Russians. Very interesting. And the website is remoteviewingmatrix.com in case anybody wants to go there. And, my God, very fascinating stuff you've been involved with most of your life, I, I must say, Ed. Yeah, I've lived about at least one and a half, two lives, I think. I mean, I should have been dead a lot of times, but uh, I used my nine lives up that somebody is watching out uh, for me. And that, I believe, wholeheartedly. Love that. And by the way, did you ever like the nickname that was given to you, Dr. Doom? I was given that name at, originally at the White House uh, because I briefed the president and the, and I briefed the, his execs and, and the the, the, the we call it the Western, the Western, the the West Wing, yeah, the West, the West Wing. wing yeah, why yes. I used to brief there, and the stuff that I was briefing on was very, very scary. Very you know, dark. Yes. Here comes the Air Force, and they brief on Russian megatonnage and throwaways, blah blah blah. The guy sitting at the desk just scribbling and doodling, listening to the briefing. And I come in and say, okay, this is what the Russians are doing. They're developing Nadja Nadja Oxy and a Cobra talk. Cobra, the, the Indian Cobra toxin. They're putting it in, uh, mixing it up with E. coli, oh, and they wow. plan on spraying that on at uh, New London submarine base before, as as the sailors are getting into their tactical nuke, their their boomer, and then about 12 hours later, everybody on board the ship will feel like uh, Indian Cobra is biting them in the stomach, and then they will die. So that's, what, that's the kind of reason I got called Dr. Doom at the White House. I still think that's one of the most uh, badass names anyone could be given, to be honest with you. Yeah, other people are called Dr. Doom in the economics realm and <laughs> places like that. And um, I'm, I've tried my best, you know, not not to maintain that appellation, but I'm still reporting on and some stuff that's spooky. Right, and of course I must bring up the infamous kill shot which you've talked about various times throughout your career. And maybe you might have gone the date wrong, but I still think something of that nature is bound to happen. Well, Michael, right now we're at the beginning of Solar Cycle 25's Solar Max. Solar Max should last for about two years. Uh, and the sun's doing unprecedented stuff. There are more solar spots than there have been in the last 20-something years. Uh, so that uh, that's that, and I predict that this solar max will be 
the beginning of the kill shot uh, sequence. But more, more interestingly and intriguingly, the satellite, that, I mean the comet C uh, 2023A3 that's in the sky right now, that or the timing of that appearance and the orbit exactly matches this passing space body that we we talked about with this huge event called the kill shot looming ahead. Scientists are now call, calling that neologism is they're using it now as well. 